Hello, everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown, and this is Hangout number 128, and happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> we've, ha we've been having a bit of a discussion before the show, and uh, there are some of us who are kind of not expecting to get mm, flowers, candy, a heart-shaped card, and a dinner out. Some of us are just going to be having dinner by the television set. It's a, it's a sad thing. Oh, not me. But <laughs> so I welcome everybody here who who has someone to spend Valentine's Day with, make it special. And the rest of us who, well, <laughs> the rest of us. <laughs> but on that note, because I always love to believe in beauty, I want to recommend for all those staying home tonight, to watch this wonderful movie. You can probably find it on YouTube, Netflix, or uh, um, uh, Amazon Prime. It's called Via Zara. Yes, you have to read subtitles because it's a Hindi movie. This is Shah Rukh Khan, my absolute favorite actor of all time. This is Preeti Zinta. And this is most one of the most wonderful, wonderful love stories I have ever watched. It's just so beautiful. A man who would give his life for her. And he lives in India and she lives in Pakistan. They fall in love over one day and she goes back to Pakistan and is being forced into a horrifying marriage. And her, her mother says to her, well, she goes, what about, you know, you and dad? Would, would, dad, would dad die for you? And she goes, oh, come on now. <laughs> Men don't do that. And she says, I know a man who would. And so the story is about the two of them and his efforts to reunite with a woman he loves. And it's absolutely the most beautiful story. <sighs> it's a real tear, tear jerker, and it's got gorgeous music and all of that. So I recommend Viazara tonight. Um, and I also want to say this, you know, not everybody gets somebody they have undying love with, but there are people that we love. Uh, there are husbands and wives that we love and partners that we love. There are parents that we love. There are children that we love, friends that we love, and patrons that I love. And um, we don't always get all of those in life. But if we get some of them, hey, be happy we get some of them. Because life can, can be a, a kind of an up and down place, and we don't always get everything we wish. And from a lot of the stories that I do on, uh, on my channel, <laughs> some of you will say, I'm pretty glad I'm not in certain relationships because they didn't end well. <laughs> so. Anyway, let me say hello again to everybody who's in the chat room before we get on to the news and the different stories of the day. Let's see who new has come in. Uh, Valerie is here. Um, who else is here? And I want to see some snide comments because we had them before we started the show. Um, Pam is here. <laughs> and uh, let's see who. Uh, let's see what comments. Um, oh, <laughs> you're blessed if you have a handful of people who love you. That is absolutely correct. We we don't you know. It, if we have, if we have, if we have friends, even two good friends, one good friend, and we have whatever we have in our life that is somebody that we love and who cares about us, hey, it's a good thing. I think that's a great way of saying that. Um, oh, that's nice, Clarissa. I had mine for twenty years at least. You know, sometime we don't know how long anybody is going to be with us, and if you got somebody for twenty years that was that person. That's, that's amazing and wonderful. Sad that they're no longer here, but it's still amazing and wonderful. Um, let's see. <laughs> Harper says, having my wonderful Valentine dinner of Arctic char and roasted vegetables with my Valentine fat. Aw. <laughs> see? <laughs> um, what? Oh, this is not related to that. Uh, I am surprised that Pat hasn't done a video on the Rachel Morin uh, sketch uh, yet. And okay, let me start with going to the show right now. So we, I don't spend all my time just shit chatting about Valentine's and not getting any. Anyway, so Rachel Moore. Yes, there has been um, a sketch done. Uh, but I'm concerned about the sketch. I don't know if I give it that much credibility. So essentially what happened is Rachel Moore was, uh, was murdered on, on a bike path, um, a walking trail, the mom pa trail uh, in, in Maryland um, and in Bel Air, Maryland. And I've, I did a, uh, a profile on the case, which I presented, uh, the family asked me to present it on television, which I rarely do, but I did it. And also we did a an English version of the profile and a 
a Spanish version, and they sent it. They the family did that. I did the English version. They fixed it all up really nice, and then they did had it translated to Spanish, which I thought was great, and distributed out through the area. Um, it's been quite a while now, a number of months, and they can't find this guy. And what's really amazing about the Rachel Morin case is that um, there was DNA found at the scene, and that DNA matched a guy who com committed some kind of it's real questionable. Uh, home invasion, sexual thing, which, but it's very vague in LA. And there's a video of the guy coming out of the house, but you only see the back of his head. And they think he's Hispanic. They guess, guess that. Um, and what they've got now is a sketch in uh, Bel Air, Maryland, where people say they think they saw this guy on the path before like more than one time, like he, he didn't just roll into Bel Air a day before. And I, I believe that's true. I believe he was living around there at the time. How long is there? I don't know. But um, so they have this sketch and the hair looks the same because, you know, <laughs> it's the same as the guy in the video. So I don't know the people actually saw that hair or whether they're throwing that hair on him. And then he has a face. But, you know, this these are people who a few people who claim they saw this guy, um, they, this was, they saw this guy prior to this happening, not the day, but, you know, prior, like in days or weeks prior. Now I'm going to say there's got to be more than one Hispanic dude rolling down that, that, that path. Um, or somebody who's not Hispanic, who maybe is, the guy isn't even Hispanic. We don't even know. Um, but how accurate that sketch is. And I still don't understand why they don't have a sketch in California because somebody in that house, the guy wasn't wearing a mask and yet he was in the house and you see somebody closing the door after he leaves. That person had to see his face. I, said, I haven't, is most, that, that's the thing that I do not understand. <laughs> Why doesn't California have a, that sketch would make sense because somebody was face to face with it in that house because the guy is not wearing a mask. So I would go more with a sketch from California than I would some people who thought they saw a guy that could be the guy. So that's my thoughts on that. And that's why I really haven't done anything with it yet, because I'm just like, eh, I don't know if that's got any great meaning. So that's problematic. Um, I, didn't he carry shoes? I think he did. I'm trying to remember now. It's been a while since I looked at that. But they have not, the DNA has not matched anybody. So he is not in the system. So they put it in CODIS. He's not in the system. He hasn't been arrested for any kind of felony thing before. So that either means, He's not committed a major crime um, or uh, he's never been caught, <laughs> you know, for committing the crimes or he's uh, could be an illegal immigrant and therefore he's not in any bank and he hasn't committed any crimes to get caught. So it's hard to say, really very hard to say. But um, yeah, so it's like there's not enough yet. I just don't understand why they don't have a sketch from LA. That's the thing that's bugging me. So I know nobody answers that question. I, I can't, I, I haven't gotten an answer on that. All right, let's see. Mm -hmm. What do we want to talk about? All right. First, um, there's so many things, I guess I, I guess I should talk about, hmm, let's, since this is in court right now and Sarah has brought this up, I will talk about it. Um, it is, there we go. It's Kayla Montgomery. She is testifying about her stepdaughter's murder in, in the court, and she's testifying against um, her husband. Um, so, and, and one of the, the, so she's completed her testimony about Harmony. Monk, this is the Harmony Montgomery uh, murder trial. Now, this is, this is, the unfortunately horrible daddy named Adam Montgomery. And that is the little girl harmony, which is just so sad. And, um, and this is, this is Kayla Montgomery when she, well, she looks like crap and she was arrested and charged with felony welfare fraud for collecting food stamps in the name of her missing stepdaughter, Harmony Montgomery. Um, both of them were like, I don't know all the drugs they did, but meth, I think, was one of them. Both both, both basically addicts. And they were living in a house, and they got booted out of the house. So now they were living at that point in a car, a car with the kids, sleeping in the car with the kids. And um, now you might wonder um, if, if, the, if, if Adam Montgomery was a, the scumbag that he was, why did he end up with his daughter? And he fought for custody for her, which is just amazing. 
uh, well, it's because her mother also was a, was a, was a drug addict. So sometimes what you see in these cases is that the whole lot of people involved in drugs and drug addiction and bad, bad behaviors due to the drugs. Um, now that doesn't mean they're not questionable people to begin with. Um, cause a lot of times the question is, did they do drugs and then lose their sense of how to behave in general? And are they so desperate for drugs? They will do anything to their children, uh, because they're under the influence of drugs or because they need drugs and they're, I'm not going to get in that big argument, but there's also people who are also psychopathic who then also do drugs. And so what you have is a psychopath who's doing drugs and therefore still is already has, or she already has that lack of feeling toward the child. Um, now, interesting enough, uh, the, the mother of Kaylee Montgomery says, well, she, she, she didn't think she was such a bad person, but she did admit that Kaylee lied a heck of a lot. <laughs> well, you see right here, she's lying to the welfare people because she's getting food stamps in the name of her dead stepdaughter, who she knows is dead. Um, and never reported it to the police uh, and kept her two children at that time. I thought someplace she said she had three, but with that guy. So she was with him and put after he uh, allegedly killed his um, daughter. And how did he do that? Supposedly, the problem was when they were living in the car, uh, she had problems going to the bathroom. Uh, and parent, she had been toilet trained. She's old enough. So she, suddenly she had this problem. Well, she could have had the problem because of abuse. She also had the problem because her, her parents were doing drugs and were like whacked out while they were in the car. And then she's there not knowing how to, where to, she needs to go to the bathroom and nobody's paying any attention. Can she just get out of the, the car and pee in the parking lot because they were staying behind some kind of complex? Or does she just desperately wait and try to get them to help her and they didn't and then she loses control and then father beats her and eventually one of these times he punched her out enough to kill her and then then and then uh, Kayla who's testifying in court here um she's basically saying yeah yeah I saw, I saw all of this she saw all of this she was there when the child was punched out uh, she was there when the child was put into, a, a, I think, some kind of bag and put in the trunk of the car. She was there when he decided to chop her up. I mean, unbelievable. And so she, however, has only gotten, what did she get for her? I'm trying to see if I find the how much she got for time so far. Um, she is the, the star witness for the prosecution. And one of the things, Sarah, you brought up, and I think it was reasonable to bring this up. It's like hubby, ex-hubby, Adam, is not in court. He refused to show up in court. And the question is, is was, this a, a, was this a prosecution move? Did not have him show up in court. She is, on, if, you, if you look at any of her videos over at Law and Crime on YouTube, the comments about her are vicious. Everybody hates Kayla. They're like, what kind of person, what kind of person watches this kid be tortured and then get killed and does nothing and stays with this guy? And she even says this, I still care about him. So pretty much she's a fairly revolting character who nobody likes. So ex-husband isn't in court to be the, I think, Sarah, you point out this interesting point that he's not like there as people, if people could look at him while she's testifying, they'd realize also that he was this evil, conniving, controlling, domestic abusing child killer and might have a little bit of mercy for her. Um, so is this a prosecution move to make her just be able to, to say these things and have them, everybody hate her to take him down? I would say no. I think it's a defense move. Why? The defense is claiming that Kay Kayla really was the one who killed the child. Um, so they're saying the defense is, because lo looking at the situation here, they have not found Harmony's body. Um, so the a lot of the testimony is she is the witness. Kayla is the witness. So they're trying to discredit the witness by making her look so bad that she was the one who actually killed Harmony. And her husband covered it up out of 
great love for her. <laughs> um, so if anybody removed Adam from the court, and he could have removed himself. He's not required to be in the court. Um, so he did not show up while she testified. He could have, I mean, it may be neither side did anything. Maybe Adams just had said, oh, that's that crap, and didn't show up. Or the defense said, hey, Adam, don't show up. If you show up, people will look at you, the evil guy, and they will feel sorry for her. What we want them to do is hate the living heck out of her because we want our case is going to be she killed Harmony, not you. I think that's a defense tactic. Um, it's, it's a despicable case. Um, what, what, what bothers me more than anything about this, I'm trying to find the, the how much she, what time she got. I think she's only gotten like, um, like a year and a half or something for like uh, lying, basically. And she's, and, 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 and basically becoming the star witness for the prosecution. They want to put him away because they, they believe he killed Harmony, which I think is true. And so they're willing to give her a break in order to put him away. This is what happens quite often. But what disgusts me is the issue of aiding and abetting. Once you have a child who in your realm, like in the car, and you, you do nothing to protect that child, and he and and this was not the first time Adam beat on her. He apparently did it a lot. So, you know, once you see your husband beating on his his daughter, that's when you take your two other children and run like hell. But of course, she's doing math or whatever she's doing. She wants drugs, and she wants him, because a lot of women will sacrifice their children for their men, and that's disgusting. Um, but she, um, in my opinion she should be in prison for the rest of her life for allowing this to happen and not do not doing anything about it, never reporting it to the police. After the child was murdered, she didn't go to the police either. She helped him essentially by not going to the police, get rid of Harmony's body so that he could get away with the crime. I think he needs to be in prison for the rest of his life and she needs to be there along with him. But you no, know, the court system as it is, I think the prosecution is saying, "Look, we're, we're we can only go after one of them, so we're gonna we're gonna give her a break as long as she testifies against him, because uh, we we at least want to put the guy who actually killed her away, even if and she, people claim, oh, she was abused, therefore she didn't couldn't make choices, blah blah blah, you know. But um, and that's what the defense the de defense is not going to say that they're not going to say she was a victim. The defense is going to say she was actually the one who killed Harmony, and Adam was the victim." I'll uh, see so yeah, how that all plays out. But I think it, I think um, Adam not being in the courtroom is actually a defense move. That, that's my theory on that. But I'm I'm not really a, a legal person and I don't follow um, I don't follow trials mostly because I don't have the time to sit there and watch them all. And so I don't do that. But uh, interesting stuff. Um, let's see. Um, <laughs> they are both equally as gross. Well, that, that that is true. I mean, I mean, I would say a little bit worse on his point because it was his daughter. That's his daughter, and he killed her, allegedly. Um, for her, I would say, I, I, you know, this whole drug thing. I said the drug thing. Uh, people just they have to stop downplaying drugs because drugs are, uh, you know, even if you're a psychopath, if you don't do drugs. Children have a better chance of survival. <laughs> they do. I mean, but once you start getting involved in that stuff where you, well, it also allows you, it's not so much that the drugs make you kill. It's that the drugs take away fear and they give you power. All right. That you just don't care. Some, some people have called it, you know, um, like alcohol, they'll call it um, liquid, liquid courage. So you'll have a psychopath who's like, oh, I can't wait to rape somebody today. They might drink a little bit just to get a little liquid courage. Just like if you go to a bar, you know, you're like, I want to talk to the ladies, but I'm kind of a, you know, I have a couple of beers. Hey, how you doing? And you just get, you get a little bit or more relaxed. So alcohol has been called liquid courage. But when you get into um, methamphetamine and, uh, and, and drugs that hype you up, it takes away fear. And it also makes you agitated. So a psychopath is just can be just pushed over the edge. 
by doing these things, something I may not have done once they're agitated and uh, in that drug mode may have less control because they don't, they're not worried about it and they have that adrenaline running. So I, I, I will say drugs didn't make them do it, but drugs didn't help. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, uh, uh, Kurt says, I hope they won't get their hands on drugs in prison. That would be real punishment for them. Oh, the drugs in prison are flowing everywhere. Oh, they are. It, it, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Speaking of drugs, you know I have this thing about um, the issues of drugs coming into the United States. I thought this was absolutely super fascinating. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Hold on. Not that. <laughs> Here we go. All right, so we're out now on an uh, Indian reservation. And it says here, not even once. Now, you wonder what this is all about. And when I say Indian reservation, that is an old terminology, which I'm probably going to get slammed for, Native American reservation. All right, Native American reservation. They're saying never even once. They're talking about methamphetamine. It is decimating. It's decimating the people. You know, if you, if you care about Native Americans, you want you want to stop this crap. OK, let me tell you what happened. And I think it's just this is just phenomenal. I mean, it's a great story uh, in a horrifying way. Let me find it. Oh, <laughs> I got to work hard to find it. Here we go. I've talked about this before, the Mexican drug cartels. Uh, and, you know, the reason I kind of sometimes this is my soapbox. I mean, because I just see so much damage being done. And I'm like, you know how much less crime we'd have if we got rid of drugs? People claim, people like they they're upset about alcohol. Oh, alcohol! You know, you know, people shouldn't drink alcohol because sometimes they get drunk, drunk, they do drunk driving, they hit they hit people and kill off a family, they come home drunk, beat up a wife and kill it. I'm not saying alcohol in excess is good. And of course, we tried to get rid of alcohol once in the United States, didn't work well. Uh, that engendered a lot of crime, but. There are some things you got to say, maybe this is worse. And I'm going to say this is worse. Now, this is fascinating. Mexican drug cartels are targeting America's last best place. Cartel associates have flooded Montana. Montana. And, you know, we all we all think of uh, drugs coming into major, major cities. New York, Chicago, you know, Miami. This is Montana. And, and. This is this is just I I already know the background on the stories I've already been aware of this but I think I think a lot of people aren't. Um, cartel associates have flooded Montana with fentanyl and meth, and also set up operations on Indian reservations. See, it says Indian here. <laughs> Indian reservations, uh, where law enforcement is scarce. Isn't this interesting? This is just so flaming interesting to me. I I'm always interested in how how we stop crime and how, you know, why can crime can persevere, why crime can get out of control. What happens on the evening of March 17th, 2020, a former Mexican police officer <laughs> working for the Sinaloa cartel, you know, and, and unfortunately in Mexico, there are quite a few police officers that do work for the cartels. This guy's now former, but anyway, he left his hotel room in Tijuana and walked across the U.S. border into Southern California at 10.09 p.m. Ricardo Ramos Medina's first stop was San Diego International Airport, where he picked up a rental car. He drove to a nearby location and met a female drug mule who handed off a grocery sack filled with methamphetamines. Then he set out on a much longer journey, a 16-hour drive to Montana. Medina had made the trip a handful of times before. But this time it didn't go as planned. Before he reached uh, Butte, he was pulled over by state and federal officers. Inside his Jeep compass, they found two pounds of pure methamphetamine. Enough, authorities said, to supply the entire town of Townsend, Montana for multiple days. The arrest was outlined in court papers and interviews with investigators on the case helped bring down a drug trafficking ring. The federal prosecutors said had brought in at least 2,000 pounds of meth and 700,000 fentanyl-laced pills 
into Montana from Mexico over the last three years. Here's a picture. Look at that crap. That's 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 a drug cartel right there. That's a drug cartel. Why Montana? Right? It boiled down to money. He could make so much more profit from drugs he sold there than any other place. Who would have thunk? You know what I mean? That's just like you never would think that. Illegal drugs have long flowed from Mexico to more remote parts of the U.S., but with the rise of fentanyl, cartel associates have pushed more aggressively into Montana, where pills can be sold for 20 times the price they get in urban centers close to the border. That's fascinating. Um, some areas of the state have become awash with drugs, particularly the Indian reservations, where tribal leaders say crime and overdoses are surging. On some reservations, cartel associates have formed of relationships with indigenous women as a way of establishing themselves within the community to sell drugs. Law enforcement officials and tribal leaders said, more frequently, traffickers lure Native Americans into becoming dealers by giving away an initial supply of drugs and, and then turning them into addicts indebted to the cartels. Right now, it is as if fentanyl is ruining our reservation, said Marvin Weatherwax Jr., who serves on the Blackfeet Tribal Business Council and represents the 15th District of the Montana House of Representatives. Cracking down on the drug trade is especially challenging in a state as vast as Montana, where law enforcement struggles to police the wide open spaces, and Indian reservations rely on underfunded and short-staffed tribal police forces. So when you, when you don't have outside police, because this became a big issue that we have seen in many places where a community says, we only want people from our community, but the people in the community don't want to do it. <laughs> you know, we have that problem um, in, in African-American communities. People say, well, we don't want Caucasian police officers because we think they're racist. We want, we want African-American black police officers. And the people in those locations are like, oh, heck no. <laughs> I don't want to do that. Why? Because if you are a police officer in that location, people look down on you. They call you an Uncle Tom. And you could call you all kinds of names. They, you know, you, you get a bad name. So it's like, I don't want to do it because I don't want to work among people who already don't like police officers. And now you want me to be one of them. So unless the community supports the police officers, nobody wants to do the job. So Native American reservations, how many people want to be police officers to begin with? And then if they are, are they well respected within the reservation or are people start saying, you're working for the man, whatever that man is. <laughs> so anyway, this, this is a huge problem. And I just find that really fascinating. Um, and this is going into a rural, rural communities. And I think that's just something to recognize. Um, and that's my soapbox for today. Thank you very much. <laughs> I just very anti-drug. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Sarah says, I only know I named my dog after the first Native American female who was in the N WNBA. That's all I got. <laughs> Wait a minute. What's the name of the dog? I want to know the name of the dog. So, Clarissa does too. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's just, uh, yes, fentanyl is ruining everything. It is like the most terrifying drug I've ever encountered. Uh, well, I haven't encountered it myself because I'm no, no, nowhere near drugs, but that I have seen uh, be a part of the, what's happening in our country. It's just frightening. So anyway, that was just that. I just had to do that. Okay, so now I want to talk about, uh, Sarah brought up another interesting case. And um, let me find it. Okay, uh, this is the case. And it's, 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 it's a really, it, I have a lot of, um, hmm, this is um let me let me find let me find the story here. Um hold on, hold on. Okay. This is a story about a a, a, a delivery in a hospital have gone really, really freaking bad. Okay. <laughs> really, really bad. Okay, this is this is the couple over there, and she's she's they went to the hospital to have a baby. And I'm gonna tell you about the other person in a little bit, but um, so they go to, let me, let me try to find the whole story here. Um, the baby was decapitated. At least that's the claim during the delivery, which isn't a good thing at all. All right. So I think this is the one I, I say, okay. The death of the baby. So they went to the hospital 
They went to Southern Regional Medical Center in Georgia. The baby who was decapitated in a had trouble delivery last year, died of a homicide. And it's this is going to be interesting about the homicide label, okay? Uh, the, the Clayton County Medical Examiner's Office in Georgia announced on Tuesday. All right, so what happened? They were investigating the death of uh, um, uh, the newborn, Trayvon Taylor Jr. since his death on Jul July 10th, 2023 at Southern Regional Hospital. Prosecutors have not announced the charges in the case. Uh, last year, Tra Trayvon's parents, Jessica Ross and Trayvon Taylor Sr., sued the hospital, the nurses, and the doctor who were in charge. Now, this is this is the story. Um, the obstetrician, and uh, quotes, negligently applied excessive force on the baby's head and neck during the attempted vaginal delivery causing decapitation. They claimed the healthcare providers failed to address the difficult hour long, uh, hours long labor through adequate measures. For example, providers allegedly did not do a C-section in a timely manner or call for help in a timely manner. The baby's head and the rest of his body emerged separately. Uh, but medical providers worked to keep the parents in the dark about the truth. And, uh, and from them about the dead child. Although the parents demanded to see and hold their baby, they told them they were not allowed to touch and hold him. Hospital staff allowed the young couple to only view their dead child, only view. During this viewing, I almost want to laugh here, which is terrible. <laughs> I'm going to hell, but it's just, it's so unbelievable. <laughs> During this viewing, <laughs> it's just awful. I shouldn't laugh. It's so bad. Their baby was wrapped tightly in a blanket. With his, that's awful. With his head propped on top of his body. Who does that? I mean, sorry. I laugh at very bad things. In such a manner that those viewing him could not identify that he'd been decapitated. So, to, say what? So, I mean, put a black. Ah. Uh, it's so horrible. I'm, I'm only laughing because it's so <laughs> horribly ridiculous. Oh my God. I, I'm, I can't even, I'm having trouble even fathoming the hospital. Like, do you, do you get a group of people sitting around going, okay, how do you want to stage this? You know, okay, put the body here. Can you just drop the head on top. And I mean, what the heck? What the heck? Okay, I'll control myself. I'm not laughing at this. I'm just laughing because I. <laughs> It's so horrific. Oh, oh, healthcare providers allegedly encouraged the mother and father to have their son cremated instead of being sent to the funeral home for burial. It was only on July 13th, several days after the delivery and a day after Ross left the hospital, that staff told them about the decapitation. All right, what really happened was the Clay County Medical Examiner's Office said that the case landed on his radar when the Willie Watkins Funeral Home contacted them. In other words, the staged still together baby was then sent to the funeral home. And they're like, shouldn't these things be together? And um, they contacted them and to see if anybody reported Taylor Jr.'s death. Watkins FH, uh, the funeral home, uh, information was that the baby had died on July 9th or 10th. And that a private pathologist was hired by the family to perform an autopsy. Uh, Watkins mentioned that they called us because they thought it was unusual that an office had not, was not involved. So the, the, this is what the funeral home says. After we retrieved the body from Southern Regional, I was called downstairs to see what they had brought back from the hospital. And that's why I noticed, I, I noticed the baby's <laughs> going to hell. <laughs> the baby's head was not attached to the body. I mean, you know. Just, I mean, it's like really. I mean, you just. Uh, I love the way they just say it. I noticed. Yeah. I mean, oh, oh, this is what. <laughs> uh, like a teenager at a table telling stories with her teenage friends, and everybody laughs. All right. Oh, the, <laughs> That's what raised the red flag. You think 
I'm sure that, I mean, the funeral home did a great job, by the way. But I'm just like, I'm sitting there in the mind of these people and they get this kid. It's just delivered as if this is something natural. And they're like, one of these things should be attached to the other. I mean, to receive a baby from the hospital with that condition was a first red flag. Actually, the baby should have come from the medical examiner. That's true. I mean, if something happens to a baby that is kind of obvious, it's not natural death, that you should go through the medical examiner first. Why the heck did it jump the medical examiner? Um, and that's why they called the medical examiner to see what, what if it had been reported. According to the county medical examiner's office, the, their chief investigator uh, asked the Georgia, Georgia Bureau of Investigative Medical Examiner's Office to perform another autopsy. And the investigator also reached out to the Clayton County Police to tell them about the incident and the facts her office had at that point. So the actual cause of death was fracture dislocation with complete transection, upper cervical spine and spinal cord. This was because of a shoulder dystocia, arrest of labor and fetal entrapment in the birth canal. Shoulder dystocia is an entrapment of the baby's shoulders during delivery. Uh, other significant conditions that contributed to death were pregnancy-induced diabetes and premature rupture of the membranes, according to the statement. Now, let me just tell you, let me show you this. Okay, this is this is what happens. This is a thing called dystocia, it means lack of progress. Well, a shoulder, but just shoulder dystocia is a different thing. Shoulder dystocia means lack of pro progress at the shoulders. Um, so basically, the baby gets stuck in there. And the shoulder does not come through, so the baby does not come out. So some of the midwives call this sticky shoulders. It's not a clinical term, but they're basically saying the baby's kind of stuck in there, those sticky little shoulders, and we got to somehow get him out. All right. There are things that cause shoulder displays. Uh, sorry, did I say that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, dystocia, sorry. Dystocia. Um, there are things that are signs. Now, only one in like 600 deliveries have this kind of issue. And so the question is, some people jump to the conclusion you should just do a C-section for every one of these deliveries if something small shows up. And then you'd be doing 599 unnecessary cesareans. And sometimes the cesareans end up with damage to the baby or the mother. So it's one of those, how do you weigh it out things. But when a child gets stuck with the shoulders, one of the problems is, and I'm going to say this from, this is a personal experience for me, that there are certain obstetricians when they're delivering babies in a hospital, that they've been taught certain things, that they're not as good at doing natural childbirth as would be a midwife. In other words, they don't put the mother in a position, for example, a squatting position, which opens up the bones, which would allow the baby to come through more easily. Now, even a midwife doing a home delivery might end up a situation where even if she puts the woman in a squatting position, the baby still gets stuck in there. And it's, it's the fright of all midwives and all doctors. But I do know that hospital doctors have a very, sometimes a very limited methodology of delivering babies. They want the woman on their back. They want her in the stirrups. They, they give drugs that just dis disturb the labor. They don't let them walk around. There's all kinds of things that happen in a hospital. And I know this because I was a medical sign language interpreter for 15 years. And I saw a bunch of stuff that was really concerning. Um, disclaimer, I had my first child in a hospital. It was, a, I had a natural birth and I fought the doctor's tooth and nail and I was 23 years old. I had natural birth, but according to them, I should have had a C-section. I didn't, and I had a perfectly normal natural birth. Second child, I had an unattended home birth at home with a very, very lay midwife who wasn't really quite a midwife, my midwife yet. That was my second child. My daughter had a home birth as well. Um, a beautiful home birth. Everything was beautiful with a, with a nurse midwife. Um, so I've seen hospital births. Some go well, some have problems. And home births are, it's one of those things that my own sister, this is my sister, Carol Sutter. Uh, she was a certified nurse midwife and she worked as a, she wasn't a lay midwife. She was a nurse midwife. And the doctors went against all the midwives and threw them out of New York. And so she became a financial consultant because she couldn't work in the field anymore after the doctors got rid of her because they only wanted obstetricians. But there was this always a fight between obstetricians and nurse midwives as to how a birth should proceed and what is a better safety method. Um, so a lot of people who do like a home birth will want to make sure that 
you know, fairly close to a hospital in case of an emergency. So it would take no more time to get from the house to the hospital than it would a lot of times in the hospital to wherever they need to be in the hospital. Um, and that it, home birth is often considered because of the gentle procedures, uh, sometimes much safer than the hospital. And you can argue that, and I'm not going to get into that, but this, in this particular case, the woman who delivered the, the obstetrician delivered this child, apparently it didn't go well. Okay. And but before then, this is another thing. That's one of these things. Again, I, I talk about, I talk about focusing on, on facts as opposed to emotions. Um, there's, there's a new thing going around where uh, pe people African-American are upset that they often uh, don't get African-American doctors and obstetricians, and they feel like they're not getting the proper care because they're, of a different race. I don't agree with that, but hey, I can see sort of their point, but this was their obstetrician. Uh, uh, Tracy Lynn Julian, she's the one who is now up for a homicide uh, uh, charge. Um, she um, she has, look at the rating she has, 51 ratings, almost five star. So the question comes down to, did she really do a bad job? Or is this the way the job is always done and things just went horrifyingly wrong? How the baby's head got separated, I don't know. Usually what happens is sometimes they gently pull on the baby's head gently in order to dislodge or move the head a certain way. How the, I don't understand the baby. Then this we do not have any information on. When they say the baby's head was decapitated, <clears throat> did that happen because at that point the baby was dead and after when they're doing the C-section, the only way they could remove both parts of the body was to then remove both parts of the body with, with a cut through the neck, neck area because the baby was already dead. Nobody talks about this. And much as I'm not in favor of hospital births, you can see, um, I want to hold a little bit of maybe, maybe the decapitation of the baby wasn't because she broke the baby's neck and ripped the baby's head out. I, I find that a little hard to believe. Now you can do damage to the baby by pulling on his little head. Um, there are problems with that. When you have a child that's stuck, how do you get it out at that point? The head is out and the rest of the body's in. So there are children who have ended up with cerebral palsy. Uh, there, you know, other things, damp, brain damage from being moved around and maybe cervical damage. Um, but for the head completely to be, I mean, I don't can't imagine that she literally yanked the baby's head off the body. Okay, and that's what that's the I think that's the viewpoint everybody has. I I have to believe that the baby had died, and when they did the C section, the only way that worked was to separate the body from the head. Um, so I don't know why she's getting a homicide charge at this point. Much as I'm not fond of hospital births, and I'm a midwife supporter, 100. Um, percent Again, taking my emotions out of it. Did. Did she do something that was completely wrong or did she not? Was she following general protocol and all things just went badly as sometimes things do? Or did she make bad choices all across the board? Uh, and the reason I say this is because I know there's, there have been situations where I've seen this with uh, mid, lay midwives as well, um, where they have delivered like, thousand thousand children perfectly healthy and a thousand one it's a it, you know a child dies and they lose their they, they end up in prison because they lost a child during childbirth but you know childbirth has always been a dangerous thing you don't children don't always survive childbirth and neither does the mother so the question comes down to when it's a when you're when you're dealing with a dangerous life event sometimes you lose and you can do everything you can to prevent losing but are you can you blame somebody if they lose under circumstances which nobody would have been successful? Now, I don't know all this story on this case yet. Um, I don't I, no, it hasn't gone to court. I don't know whether she feels sorry for the obstetrician or, or despise the obstetrician. I certainly feel sorry for the parents just because they lost a baby. Could something better have been done? I don't know. I don't know because I, I can't, I don't even know the whole procedure of how the whole pregnancy went along and how the whole birth went along. Well, I will say this, this guy on the right, this guy on the right was a pathologist that the family asked to, to check up, to, to take care of the baby. I mean, to, uh, re, you know, uh, review, uh, to do an second autopsy on the baby. He puts the crap out on, what's it, was it Instagram? 
He put the autopsy of the baby and pictures of the baby out on Instagram. They're suing the crap out of him. And that definitely should be done. Who does that? Who does that? I mean, the parents just lost their child. You're going to put pictures, of the autopsy on social media. What kind of piece of garbage are you? That, 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 that just, that blew my mind. I mean, that's 100% unnecessary because he wasn't showing this to a small group of people like, like other pathologists. He's showing it to the general public. He, de he deserves to go down. <laughs> that, that I don't have any question about. He deserves to lose his license and go down. Um, so, uh, okay, let me go here. I, Sarah, this is a good point. All right. Okay, I didn't get into the hospital side of it. Yes, the doctor's number one duty is to self-report. I agree with that. Um, the hospital, it appears at this point, the hospital tried to cover up a very bad ending to this birth. That's why I said, putting the baby and trying to pretend that they should have been honest with the family. If they weren't honest with the family, first of all, if they had to cut the baby's head off in order to just extract the baby from the body, they should have taken the parents aside and said, look, this horrible thing has happened and we're going to have to let you know that the only way you could remove the baby from your body was to take the head off of the body. They should have said that. And we're going to put your baby, you know, can't put your baby back together, but we want to wrap up your baby so you can hold your baby and feel your baby as though it were still together. <laughs> you know, you put that in a better way than I am. They should have done that. They didn't. Then the baby should have definitely, um, the hospital should have reported the hospital. I, I have real questions about the hospital covering up this crap. I'm sorry, sorry. I didn't even get to that yet. And I wanted to get to that. I don't like what the hospital did because even if you, even if it turns out that the, the obstetrician wasn't a bad person, didn't do a bad thing. She didn't really commit murder or homicide. Even if that isn't true, the hospital has a, um, a obligation to be honest and to make sure everything is properly investigated. I think the hospital should go down for this uh, because they lied to the family. They ignored having that child be looked at in a proper way. Even if they looked at the child, if they if it went to the medical examiner and they said, look, this is what happened. This is exactly, we have eight people in the room. We couldn't get the baby out. We had to cut the baby to get the baby out. What, what's the problem with that? Why would you just wrap the baby up and chuck it off to a, and, and skip that? Um, I think the hospital was protecting themselves against a lawsuit. That's the biggest problem we have with the, the, the medical hospitals. That's the lawsuit issue. They don't want lawsuit. They will cover up a whole bunch of crap. So I agree with you there, Sarah, 100%. Um, uh, yes, I, I, I don't know about all the forged documents yet, but it's it's very questionable what they did. Um, very questionable. Uh, um they, pa yeah, they passed the problem along to the funeral home. Not more than that, Sarah. I think they were literally trying to get it, have the problem disappear. If if the family never saw the baby in two pieces and the baby went off, skipped the medical examiner, went off to the, the, the funeral home and the funeral home didn't pay any attention, just took care of it, no one would be the wiser. The uh, family would just say, oh, sad thing happened. The baby died in birth. That's that. They... Yeah, I think the cover-up is is the bigger issue. But And the question is, was the cover-up because the doctor did wrong or did the doctor not necessarily do anything wrong, but they're covering up anyway because they don't want to take a chance on a lawsuit? Uh, and I don't know. I mean, I say I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not really, really pumped about hospital births. I've seen so many dreadful hospital births as an interpreter. Um, and I, I always point out, you know, the, the place in Washington, D.C., the worst place to go if you were pregnant in Washington, D.C., to have your baby was Columbia Hospital for uh, Columbia Hospital for Women, which my sister-in-laws went to. And they all got C-sections, every single one of them. And they were always told they were too narrow. And th these are like Jamaican girls, you know, <laughs> they were like, they were not narrow. <laughs> I mean, their grandmother had 12 babies in bed next to her husband. <laughs> she, didn't, she, she used to say she got... And then she hit her husband and say, here's the baby. My mother-in-law had six babies. 
naturally. And suddenly all my sisters in laws coming out of that same branch of the family, every one of them has a C-section. Columbia Hospital, uh, hospital uh, Columbia Hospital for Women, their C-section was the highest in the city because I think their thing was, hey, we don't want to take chances. If you go over to D, went over to DC General, which was the poorest hospital in the city, and they had the least C-section rate and the least problem rate of any place in the city. And the reason was, <laughs> I remember being, I was interpreting for some woman there and she was, she was like, they were, they had her on a machine and she's like, Oh, really bad contractions. They're bad, bad, bad. <laughs> and the nurse goes, ah, no, I don't see anything on the machine. And she's like, I feel pressure. I feel pressure. And then the nurse like, yeah, she walked out of the room and the woman's like, <sighs> she was, she looked like a slaughtered, a goat being slaughtered. <laughs> I knew what that look was. She was about to have that baby. And I went out to the nurse and said, she's going to have that baby. And the nurse says, ah, no, it's going to be ours. And I'm like, get back in here. Finally, the nurse came back in and the woman goes like this. <laughs> and the nurse picks up the sheet and she's like, oh, baby. <laughs> so, but she had a natural birth because nobody interfered with it. She didn't get any drugs. She didn't, she didn't get, she didn't get an, uh, anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's all that the the worst, considered the worst hospital in the city had a much healthier rate of natural childbirth and maternal safety than the one of the most highly rated uh, uh, places to have a baby in the city. So, as I say, I'm a little bit um, <laughs> biased, but still, we have to wait to get all the information out because that's, um, yeah. Uh, Hospital and the doctors should all get in serious trouble. I feel so bad that that for the baby. Well, again, I don't know if Charlotte, I don't know if the baby died because of mismanagement by the doctors in the hospital or the baby died and would have died anyway, because it can be a serious situation. Uh, and the hospital's covering up. Now, one could say she should have a C-section to begin with, and that would have solved the problem. And that's an argument that people will definitely uh, pursue. Um, so, you know, it's going to, it's going to, that's going to be a, that's going to be an interesting um, uh, court case because there's going to be a court case on that. <laughs> Why am I a psychopath? Oh, because I laughed about the baby. <laughs> I might be, I might be Michaela. You know, I have not been diagnosed, but a great many people on the internet have claimed that I am a psychopath. So, <laughs> so, it may be true. Who knows? I'm going to deny it. I will entirely deny it. Um, yeah, that's why they wouldn't let them touch or hold the baby because it was not in one piece. And they were, you know, having worked, I've, I've, I've interpreted for many deliveries. And I know that when a delivery doesn't go well, the baby isn't doing well, they whisk the baby away. And the parent, the mom's like, where's my, where's my, where's my, where's my baby, 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 where's my baby? And they're, they're like the whole, you can see the whole staff is freaked. They're freaked out because no one wants anything to go back. Everybody wants a happy ending. Oh, look, here's your baby. Isn't that wonderful? She's nursing it. You know, everything is good, but that doesn't always happen. And when, that, when that, you think of a person who's been through nine months of pregnancy, just looking forward to that moment when the baby enters the world, it's, it's horrific. And um, some, uh, a woman I know personally, um, just recently, um, uh, she is a, a friend of my daughter, um, and uh, she had a perfectly fine pregnancy. If you look through all her Facebook pictures, you see her getting bigger and bigger and happier and happier. Uh, she had a bunch of girls. She had like she's got two girls. This was going to be a son, and you see her all the way up to the day she went to the hospital, and then you see the picture after. You see her. She, it's, it's her Facebook main photo now. And you see her holding her little baby son, but the baby son is not alive. And that's incredibly heartbreaking. And just, it's just, you know, just to look at that picture. I'm glad she took the picture because it's always important that even if you lose your child, um, that you have that moment with the child in your arms and you have that memory. But she, the child was still born and it's the worst thing ever. And everybody in the hospital, I'm sure, when that baby was born or not born, <laughs> well, still born, what do you, how do you stand there and tell the mother? 
sorry, here's your baby. I mean, that's the worst thing ever. So, you know, some, you know, when people work in hospitals as doctors and nurses and assistants and interpreters, we, I, I, I've experienced some really bad things when I worked at the hospital where bad news was being delivered to the patient or to the patient's family. And I was the one who had to deliver the news because I was the one who could sign. Um, it's not a good moment. And those moments stick with you in your head forever and ever because they're really sad, really super sad. Um, and I, I just I, I, I just want to say, I don't know what happened in this hospital and why they made the choices they did. I understand why they probably did not want to show the baby to the family because it was in two pieces. You no, know, you're going to whisk the baby out of the room. Now, they should have told, between the time this happened and the time that they stage the baby thing, which I just, I said, that's the part that I just, I laugh horrifyingly hysterically because it just seems so awful. I mean, it's like, who does that without informing the family? If they'd inform the family and, and they, you know, that this is what happened and therefore we're going to make your child as presentable as possible that you can have that moment. You can have that photo with your child. So that, you know, you can have that good memory. You know, we don't want to have the pieces separated. I get that. But, you know, they should have talked to the family first. That The fact that they tried to fake it, if that's true, that that's the part that to me is. I can't I can't I can't go with that. That's just that's just that's just crazy. Um, <sighs> OK, how do you how do you. How do you tell the parents? Yes, it's true. I'm um, sorry. It was the other one. How do you tell the parents? Um, how do you tell the parents the head is detached? Okay. As a person who's been in the medical thing, I was 15 years as a medical sign language interpreter. You should see the things I had to interpret. When I had to tell them, I'm sorry, your daughter is dead. I'm sorry. Um, or your mother when you disconnect her from the machine, she will die. Sometimes doctors would, <laughs> I would interpret for the doctor and then they just, they just they like run out of the room and leave me with the patients crying. And I'm I'm sitting there, it's my job. I should leave with the doctor and just leave them alone. But sometimes it happens so quickly. Then they would look at me, the, the people who just got the bad news. And, and I was the one sitting there and I was the one who could talk to them because they were deaf. Um, there is no, good way except for you tell the truth as calmly as you can in a way that because there's no, you can't hide the truth you just have to tell them you'd have to tell them i'm really sorry but when 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 the baby died inside your body and we needed to take out the baby and only way was Part of the baby was stuck inside your womb. The other part, the, the head, was outside. So we had to separate and then to separate them. But the baby was already dead. And so we're really sorry because this is an awful thing to hear. But it's the only way we could do that. But we want, you know, so we, we have... Your baby is over here. We're wrapping up your baby, and we want you want you to have the have the opportunity to, to hold your baby, and look at it, you know, and 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 love your baby for the few minutes that you're going to be with a few a few days, <laughs> a few minutes you're going to be with the baby. We want you to have that opportunity. So that's that's why we're going to carefully, really, we're going to be careful, and we're going to want you to see your baby the right way. Okay, that is how I would do. But being an interpreter, I would be stuck with whatever the doctor said. <laughs> I would have no, no, no choice I, myself. Yeah, I'm old to be interpreting. But if I were a doctor, that's how I would say it. All right, so well, a super sad case, super sad case. Uh, yeah. Um, yes, exactly. You don't deny them truth and touch and closure. Thank you, that's a beautiful way to put it, Sarah. And that's where I think that, that, that there, there was, I think it was, I think they were trying to avoid a lawsuit. 
That's it. I think, and they, I think they should go down for that. If they're just, if the reason they did what they did was just to avoid a lawsuit, that's disgusting. But that is what, that is what major organizations often do. Major, major companies. And, and, and of course, uh, our health and health institutions, they will go out of their way to prevent a lawsuit. Okay. I got to get out of this because that's too sad. And I already laughed and made, made myself look like a psycho. <laughs> Speaking of psychos, let me pick out, let me pick one who really is. All right. Um, this woman, this is a bizarre case of, um, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Oh, come on, where'd it go? Uh, don't tell me I lost. Oh, here we go. All right. This woman with her baby, she was convicted. Oh, no, that's not it. Damn it all. I lost. I don't, did I really lose it? Okay. No, this is it. <laughs> it's hard to find. I tell you. This is a Missouri mom, 26 years old. She was charged with baking her child in an oven. I kid you not. She was charged with baking her child. <laughs> I'm not laughing. <laughs> I'm not laughing. No, because, it's only because of this. Claiming she mistook the oven for the baby's crib. <laughs> Seriously. This is like the worst story I've ever heard. I thought it was the crib. I opened up an oven, turned it on, put the baby in and closed it. I thought I was putting the baby in a crib. Is this the world's worst story ever? She was charged with endangering the welfare of a child. What? This is premeditated homicide. What the hell is wrong with these people? One month old baby. Baby was found dead with burn marks across her body. One of the most horrific cases ever. I, 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 I've heard of a, I know fun father put his baby in a microwave. That was pretty despicable. He also claimed that he didn't realize what the micro, that he didn't realize it was a micro. I think that was his story too. I didn't realize it. A Missouri mom has been accused of baking her newborn daughter to death in an oven after allegedly mistaking it for a crib. Mariah Thomas, 26, was charged with endangering the welfare of a child after one-month-old Zariah May was found dead with burn wounds, according to arrest warrant. Cops were called to the uh, mom's Kansas City home as reports of a child not breathing. Well, I guess not. Um, when they arrived, they found the infant covered in burns with her blackened clothing melted into her diaper. A devastated friend told her that she was a very bubbly, happy baby, smiling all the time. All right. She also suggested that Thomas's mental health may have played a role in the tragedy. Okay, now we come down to the mental health issue. Psychosis, psychopathy. Mariah had mental issues from what I know and didn't have the mindset of an adult. She thought like a child. I am going to say that my nine-year-old granddaughter knows the difference between an oven and a crib. Zariah's grandfather told police he received a call from his mom around 1 p.m. on Friday, in which he told him something was wrong with the baby, I think. On returning home, he immediately began to smell smoke and found her dead in, the, dead in her crib. Mm, she did make it to the crib eventually. Thomas told him that she had accidentally put her in the oven. Zariah was discovered by police in a car seat inside her home with apparent thermal injuries on various parts of her body. And they had a charred baby blanket as well. Okay, she... Went to the police headquarters. She invoked her Fifth Amendment right, which all people who cannot think like an adult know about. Uh, she, but she consented to detectives obtaining a blood draw and accessing her phone data. Thomas's social media presents her as a doting mom who referred to her daughter as her princess. In one Facebook post, she states her desire to be the best mother I can be to my beautiful daughter. I'm having problems with this. So... The question would be, I don't, I don't see at this point that they've proven that she has psychosis. They're saying she's a little slow. Again, slow does not mean if you can have a social media account and you can talk about you wanting to be a good mom and all this kind of crap, I'm going to say you know the difference between an oven and a crib. Now, they haven't said she was on any major like drugs or anything. So then the question is, what was the reason for doing this? And there, at this point, there is no answer, except that saying that you thought the oven was a crib is a ludicrous story. And so it's, it'll be interesting to see what the defense attorney comes up with on this one. Just unbelievable. 
Unbelievable. But on that note, I want to go to another story, which I talked about last week. And this was a story of um, she lost her, her child. Her child passed away. She's a she's an only fan porn star. Um, very popular on social media and TikTok and all of that stuff. And she she during her pregnancy, she continued doing porn while she was pregnant and which is pretty appalling right there. Her name, she get her, 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 her name is a Veruca Salt on um, uh, OnlyFans, which is actually the name of a band. So I'm sure they're thrilled about that. Anyway, last week I talked about this because I said this. She, her, her baby passed away. She went to supposedly look at her baby and her baby was not breathing. Could be SIDS, crib death. Um, and she immediately went to the, to social media to tell everybody her baby had died. And a lot of people are going, why are you on social media talking about how your baby's dead? You know, is this normal? Um, and I talked about how that in a case like this, the tricky part is trying to determine whether the baby did die naturally. And you feel really bad as a police officer or a detective, uh, a profiler saying, you know, you might want to look into this a little bit more because I might have concerns that it's Munchausen syndrome by proxy, that she killed this child on purpose. Um, but, you know, who wants to say that? I mean, so I looked at one of her videos with a baby. It's very cute. I mean, she's all, you know, I got this new outfit for my baby and she's, she's I got to, I got to go nurse my baby now. And she sounded really happy and like she really was into the baby. So I look at that video and I go, see, she seems like a, really nice person, a person who loves her baby. However, I've heard that story before as a sign language interpreter many years ago, because the one time I really, I really saw how people can fake stuff was I, I was working with a, a young woman. She was on baby number four, maybe. She all of her children, one, one, they were taken away by our social services and one died. And this one survived in spite of the fact she kept trying to get it taken out of her body at six months. But she started nursing the baby because they told her she should. And I never forgot that the, the the nurse was in the room and she's, she says, how do I do this? And the nurse says, okay, you do this. And she's like, do I do it like that? Oh, okay. And she's like, oh, thank you so much. And I'm like, oh, okay. Maybe I'm being a mean person. Cause I always thought you moonshots and send them by proxy. As soon as the nurse walked out of the room, she goes, I hate doing that. I was like, that's the kind of thing. So I'm looking at this video of Aruka Salt, whose also name is uh, Kimberly. What's her real name? Kimberly. Her real name is Kimberly Summer Hartley. Um, so she got this video and it's, it, it's it, you know, you look at it because she seems like a nice mom. She does. And who wants to accuse a nice mom, even if she is a porn star? And, you know, even if, you know, and even if she had did porn entirely through her entire pregnancy, which is revolting to me, even if maybe she's just, you know, baby just died naturally. But the, here's my problem. Last week I talked about this. She had gone to a wedding of a friend. And after the wedding ended, she vanished. Her Everything was left behind, her phone and everything. And the family and uh, friends and police were searching for her for an entire week because she had vanished. And, and people thought she had been kidnapped. Something had happened to her. They finally found her in a brothel. What kind of person does that? You know, what kind of person fakes? It's a hoax. She's faking disappearing. Sherry Papini did. So this woman did it for a week and apparently got no, nobody did anything about it. But she, her friends had just gotten married. She ruined their dang honeymoon because they thought she was dead somewhere. She wasted police money. So I'm like, that's a, that's a, that's a behavior of psychopathy. That's a behavior of Munchausen syndrome. And then you, then you go and do porn with your baby in your stomach. That's kind of a sick thing to leave your child as a, that kind of legacy for your child. So my question is, well, maybe she, once she had the baby and got through that, she didn't really want to have to take care of the thing. Maybe she prefers eliminating that child out of her life. She had her moment with it and everybody thought it was really cool and she got all kudos and now baby, oh, baby's dead. Now you get all kinds of sympathy and then you go on. 
is this, you know, is it possible? So, you know, as, as a profile, this is something I have to look at. As a police detective, you should be looking at this. Now, so far, they're calling, they're not saying it's a homicide. And last time they said it was a natural death, but now they're looking at something. They're saying police are reportedly looking into the influence influencers sleep, sleeping arrangements in regards to her six week old son after the baby died in his sleep. They're looking into sleeping arrangements. What does that actually mean? Now she said she went to the other room to check on him, which would mean she wasn't sleeping with him, but they, I guess they're questioning whether she was sleeping with him. They're still looking at it as possible, if not natural, an accident. And here's what can happen. She is a very heavy woman, very heavy, huge. And she's got big boobs. Sometimes women who, especially if they drink, do drugs, and they have the baby in bed and they're nursing it, they will roll over on the baby and suffocate the baby to death. It's an accident, yes, but brought on by poor parenting and the fact that if, you, if you're going to be drunk or drinking and or excessively huge and do whatever kind of sleep problems you have, you can't be rolling over on your baby and suffocating it to death. That's not okay. Um, I don't know that that happened. Um, now, mind you, again, from a personal experience, I did have a family bed with my kids. I nursed all my children in bed. I never had a crib. So I'm totally pro. I'm totally pro nursing in bed and going and sleeping with the children. So I, I confess. So I'm not against her. For, if she chose to do that. I'm not against it. However, I'm concerned about the fact she's very heavy. I don't know what kind of drugs or drinking she does. And I'm concerned about the fact that she exhibited Munchausen syndrome prior to this happening and has very questionable values. So if I were the police, would I be looking at this as a possible Munchausen syndrome by proxy death? I would be. Whether the, whether the detectives could ever prove it is a whole nother matter because it's very hard to prove that children, they could, that when they stopped breathing, that they didn't just stop breathing on their own for some reason or that it was accidental. Usually the only time they catch people is if, if a mother does this four times, five times, six times over and they go, it's a little strange that all their babies are dying. But I, I, the, most, uh, most detectives and most uh, um, hospital personnel Doctors don't even understand Munchausen syndrome by proxy that well. And when you see a distraught mother come in with a baby who is dead or calls, you know, calls 911, you, nobody wants to accuse a mother. But yeah, to me, the whole clue about whether you should be looking at them is history. So if anybody looked, for example, at my history at the time I had my children and I was sleeping in bed with them, nursing my babies. I don't think you would have found anybody, except for you guys now who just called me a psychopath <laughs> for laughing. <laughs> it just set me off. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> except for you guys that called me a psycho. Um, anybody who knew me, they would have nothing negative to say about me raising children. They'd know that I was a good mom. They didn't see any, I never lied. I didn't fake things. I didn't claim things that weren't true. I didn't manipulate. No, I didn't do any of those things. So, there would be no reason to believe my past showed any kind of Munchausen syndrome, which again, let me clear it up again. Munchausen syndrome is not a disease and it's, it's not a psychiatric desig. Well, they make it a psychiatric designation, but in my opinion, Munchausen syndrome and Munchausen syndrome by proxy are both just behaviors of female psychopaths, mostly female. You can have male, males do this too. A female psychopath who wants attention and control and power may harm herself or claim she's been harmed to get attention. She also may harm or claim harm to her children to get attention. She may even kill her children to get attention. That's much as in by proxy. It's a behavior of psychopathy. Instead of being a serial killer or a mass murderer or, or a drug dealer, uh, part of the cartel, you take it out on yourself or the children around you. That's how you get your power and control uh, as a psychopath. Um, does she represent behaviors that are concerning? I say yes, especially the disappearing for a week. That to me is a Sherry Papini thing. And Sherry Papini, in my opinion, exhibits psychopathy. So if I were looking at this case, I'd be looking at it, uh, whether the baby died a natural death or not. But a very, very difficult situation because she could also be, she also could be that kind of person. And the baby still could have died accidentally. And that's where it gets difficult. So <laughs> it's a tricky situation, but very, very fascinating. 
I will say that. Um, Michaela, are you in? <laughs> Michaela's in a Nancy Ang again. <laughs> a Nancy Ang update. Oh, come on, guys. There's no reason to do an update on Nancy Ang. In case you're wondering about that, Nancy Ang is a woman who went missing in Guatemala, Lake Atitlan, out kayaking. And there's a whole thing blowing up. And I've been accused of doing more than one show about it. But that's only because you guys asked. And there's nothing new to talk about about Nancy Ang. But because I knew you were going to do this to me, because I knew, I've, I, I copied this for you guys, just for you. Yes, here we go. Uh, this guy's doing a, a Instagram thing. We're we are inching closer to bringing Nancy Ng home. Yes, indeed. And he's got tons of information on how she was. She did not die naturally. And he has been milking this to. All, and he's got all kinds of stuff on his channel, his YouTube channel, his Instagram channel, like accusations about everyone. Um, and he's doing his investigation. And uh, yeah. But I'm not. I'm not going to go into it. <laughs> but I just. I just did get that picture for you guys because <laughs> I knew you're going to harass me. <laughs> ah. Let's see. Um, just want to know. She's not been found. No, she has not been found. Unfortunately, it's it's a shame because you know. And I don't know. Here's the interesting. Thing that's going to happen if they find uh, Nancy Ng. She again is the woman who went missing in Guatemala on Lake Atitlan kayaking. Her body has not been found on the lake. And there, there were some issues about how, you know, because it was cold, winter issues, a lot of uh, difficult, it was very windy and stuff, doing more um, searching for her. When they, if they find her, they're going to have a heck of a time proving anything. So I don't think she was shot. Let's, let's, let's say she didn't fall out of the, 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 the kayak and drown, like, like the woman who was near her said. She thought that's what happened. They would have to prove that she was shot or knifed or or uh, hit so hard with a kayak paddle, which they're usually not even wood. I think they're plastic. You know? How would they ever prove, unless something major damaged her body, how would they ever prove anything? So no matter what, if they find her body in the lake, which they probably will one day, and that people will, the conspiracy theory will carry on for the next 30 years. Because they're going to say she wasn't shot, she down a knife. It must be that she was pushed out of the kayak, that she was hit with a paddle. And, of course, it can't be proved, so that'll be the end of that. But uh, the conspiracy theory will carry on. It will. It will carry on. And so, okay, let me talk about the Lakewood shooting. All right, the Lakewood shooting. The reason I want to talk about this is I will not mention the, the creep's name uh, because I don't like giving any attention to mass murderers, and she was wanting to be one. So I'm not going to use her name, but here she is. All right. So I want to talk about this because we're talking about safety for children. Um, you got to wonder why Harmony Montgomery was stuck with her daddy and that and why she was living in a home, which or in a car with, with social services, not paying a damn bit of attention. We see this a lot when you have an entire family that's screwed up. All right. So in this particular case, let me find it. Um, what I the. Okay, the woman, and by the way, she sometimes uh, had a, an alias that was male. So there's a whole bunch of things on whether she's trans or not trans. I don't care about that. Then none of that makes any difference. But she had disturbing behavior prior to this. Now, what was the disturbing behavior? All right. Uh, she went, first of all, she went in to the, the, to the uh, church with uh, a firearm, and she brought her seven-year-old son with her, as you would normally do when you go commit trying to commit a mass murder. What a nice mummy. Um, later on, I found out that she exhibited Munchausen syndrome by proxy because he had a feeding tube at one point and it was supposed to be taken out, but she kept it there for years. So would I believe she's got Munchausen syndrome by proxy as a behavior of psychopathy, considering she went to a church to try to shoot it up? I'm going to say probably. Um, I want to also congratulate the people at the church who were armed because they shot her down. Now, uh, which, you know, if nobody's armed in the church and nobody's going to, Nobody would have stopped her, and God knows how many people would have been murdered. Uh, but they did shoot her. Um, one guy got shot in the leg, um, one church member, and then her son did get shot in the head in the crossfire. Uh, some people want to blame the people who shot at her, but they had no choice. Um, even her mother-in-law says, I don't blame them. They had, you know, she, It's her fault. She brought the kid to a mass murder. Okay. So anyway, 
uh, they said, and um, he's uh, still fighting for his life in the hospital. It's not looking good. Houston police said in a press conference on Monday that although Moreno had sometimes gone, I don't want to say the name, sorry, by another name, <laughs> their investigation so far led no evidence ever identified as another gender. What did I say? That doesn't matter. All right, blah, 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 blah. But um, she was in a huge custody battle and she was the biological mother of her son. She had a lengthy criminal record. I allegedly carried out the shooting with an AR-15 with the word Palestine across it, which again, it doesn't mean anything as far as what her actual beliefs were because she's she's a psychopath. She, as I point out all the time, you make up one thing or the other. Um, she apparently, despite her long history with mental illness, she'd been able to legally purchase a gun. Now she apparently had terrible, she had, when they say mental illness, it could be psychopathy, it could be psychosis, but anybody who cannot control themselves and shows the sign she did shouldn't have a gun. A neighbor said that she used to scrawl, scrawl swastikas on her property and taunted her and her grandchildren multiple times. Another claim she tried to run them over. I, I've been through hell. I've reported this, reported this, and it's gone on deaf ears, said one neighbor. I've had psychological officers out here that won't even answer the door. So they were all pissed off. Now, she is, she's been charged with, uh, let's see, what else was she charged with? Uh, she was charged with a whole bunch of crap in the past. Uh, fraud and what else? I'm trying to find out where information is on. Um, oh, she give, uh, she disappeared when she was pregnant with the boy. Um, oh, this is where the, this is the mother, ex-mother-in-law. Um, the paternal grandmother of the child says she kept him infantil, infantil, infantilized. She kept him with a feeding tube for years and was supposed to come out in weeks. How was this happening? Again, this would be Munchausen's in a by proxy. She said she disappeared when she was pregnant with a boy and gave birth without the father knowing. She added that she allegedly did not take her medication when she was pregnant. She also put on the birth certificate that the father was dead. It took the family several years to, to, to correct this. Um, uh, the boy had special needs, probably because God knows what she did to him. Um, but now, mind you, it, it is stated that she has, I say, she had a lot of, she had a long, uh, um, she had mental health issues. She was, oh, let's see. Child Protective Services investigated the family a number of times and found that this woman was diagnosed as schizophrenic and had a history of erratic, paranoid stalking behavior and diagnosis exhibiting Munchausen syndrome by proxy. And why is the child in her, in her hands? Now, the, interesting enough, the, the, the mother-in-law says that she doesn't blame, she doesn't blame them for shooting the kid at the place. That's, that's nice. But she blames the social services, uh, social welfare system, which she should. She, uh, also blames the state for allowing this person in this condition to have a gun, which again is right. But what's also interesting is that apparently her son is a sex offender. <laughs> and when they had a, when they had a hearing to keep, to get this kid away from the mom, she didn't show up. So who's acting right? Nobody's acting right. Nobody around anybody is acting right. So, I'm going to say everybody's messed up. And this is one of the problems I have with the Montgomery case too. Everybody is messed up. And when everybody's messed up, none of the services work properly. And, and there's no, you try to move the kid and you can't find a place to move the kid to. Then you don't have enough foster homes. And then you got, it, it, it's, it's a mess. It's a mess. And um, yeah. So this woman, Exhibited Munchausen Center by proxy, which I think is interesting since she took her child to the scene with her. She didn't care if that child died. And as a matter of fact, she probably wanted that child to die at the scene because that would give her some kind of sick kick. I've never seen that happen where, you know, a mother takes a child to, to a mass murder. That's a new one. That's a new one. Um, let's see. Um, Oh, we're talking about Jodi Arias here. I have never done a show on her. I'll have to do one one day on her. Um, okay, see, so Anthony's another one. That's for sure. Deb, Debbie Collier update. Oh, I don't know what happened to the Deb, Debbie Collier case. I'm going to have to check that out. You're right. And Andrea Yates. I have my own opinions on Andrea Yates. I found Andrea Yates not psychotic at the time she killed her children. But... She apparently, um, some people thought she was.
but since she carefully decided to kill them one after the other in cold blood, I'm going to say, stop blaming everything on Rusty, her husband. You know, she had choices. This concept that women don't have choices. You know, sometimes life is rough with for, for women in certain relationships. It's true. But when it comes down to your children, I get a little bit unhappy, <laughs> shall I say, with certain things. Let's see. What else did I have here? Let me see what I have picture. What is that picture? Oh, we already had her. And that's we've done that one. Okay. Um, whoa, oh, 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 we did that one. Um, uh, oh, I just want to talk about this because uh, Christine brought this up. I thought it was really interesting um, uh, that in Minneapolis, they're having this problem with, um, see if I can find it. Oh, there we go. Minneapolis PD. So Minneapolis has had a problem getting keep, keeping enough police. And I, I've been talking about a lot in Maryland here. We're having a huge problem with carjacking with teenagers because apparently they're just running rampant carjacking people with guns. And it's unbelievable. And it says here, Minneapolis police are searching for suspects after a spree of robberies on Saturday. 14 robberies over the course of the day on Saturday. This is during the day, not even at night had similar circumstances with a group of suspects getting out of a vehicle and targeting a victim on foot. Um, oh, no, no, they are saying they're later. Sorry, 8 p.m. to 1 p.m., 1 a.m. Okay, sorry, they are at night. I thought they said it was during the day. Victims' descriptions of the suspects varied and included a range of groups consisting of three to six male and female suspects. We see a lot more females involved in violent crime uh, who were juveniles or young adults. They were described as wearing dark clothing. What a surprise. And masks, what a surprise. Guns were seen in most of the cases. Eight of the 14 robberies inv uh, involved suspects using a gray SUV that had been carjacked during the day. Yes, so this is a huge trend. Carjacking, now the, a lot of times they just carjack for the fun of it and kill people doing it. Now they're carjacking and robbing people. So we're having a, this, this massive increase in crime. What do you do? How do you stop this kind of thing? And so if you go down to um, go down to El Salvador. Oh, let me bring up this first. This is one problem. We have this, this, these, these girls. Now check this out. This happened also in Minneapolis. These girls, uh, women, I should call them women. Um, they were convicted. They were convicted of, uh, they were previously pleaded guilty in connection with the killing of a Minnesota man during an attempt to steal drugs. They were released from prison last week after their sentences were reduced under a new state a law that re redefines aiding and abetting. I'm big on aiding and abetting issues. I think Kayla Montgomery aided and abetted the, the murder of, of, of that child. As she saw him, that child being beaten before and didn't report it, didn't remove the child, didn't do anything about it. If she saw him beating her then and then covered up for it, I think she aided and abetted. I think there should be high levels of charges on that. Anyway, they did get a large, they got a charge on that. 2017, Megan Cater and Bri Brianna Martinson were charged in the slaying of Col Corey Elder, 19, in Bloomington, Minnesota, just outside of Minneapolis. The killing was motivated by an attempt to steal pills from the victim. The pair stormed into Elder's apartment on April 7, uh, 27, 2017, with two others. So there was a four of them that went in. Cater and Martinson ra ransacked the home while the other two suspects violently assaulted Elder before fatally shooting him. The two women were each sentenced to 13.5 years in prison after striking a deal to avoid life sentences. 13 years. I think that's pretty reasonable. But now they're saying this. State lawmakers recently redefined laws on aiding and abetting murder, meaning only those who directly commit a murder or directly aided a killing can be charged with the crime. So now, once upon a time, if you if you and your buddy ran into a store with two guns and one of them shot the shopkeeper, both of you went down. Now what they're basically saying is the second guy who went in there with a gun wasn't aiding and abetting. Get out of here. You know, because once you when you have an increased presence of people involved in a crime, the victim has less choices. So there were four people there. So even the two people that were attacking him, two other people let those people attack him while they were ripping up his house. He knows there's two other people there as well. So four people were involved in the whole concept of coming in, attacking this guy with a weapon. And they're, that, that they were overcharged. 
They were resentenced to uh, on lesser aiding and abetting first degree burglary crimes after Elder's family provided a victim statement to the court, which I'm not even sure what that means. So they were reduced nearly five years after serving six years. So they're going to, they both uh, women were released from prison that day. They were originally scheduled to be released in the fall of 2026. Now it says here, we're grateful Megan Carter has been given a second chance by the Minnesota legislators to re-enter society. There are too many people serving lengthy sentences in Minnesota's prisons that do not reflect their minor and less culpable roles in their offenses. I want to talk about that line you cross. I'm sorry, but going with your friends to to break break an, into an apartment and and end up killing the guy and searching for drugs in his apartment, that's not a minor line. I'm sorry. This is not, but that's what happens. And when we see that happening, and then we see carjackings, and then we see the robberies, we're seeing a massive increase in, in, in crime. And the, the point that I wanted to make was over what happened in El Salvador. El Salvador's uh, president, uh, Nayib Bukele, and his party won resoundingly in the elections on Sunday. So his running mate has said they are replacing democracy. Now, they call him a dictator. Why is that? Well, what happened with him is, if you all remember, El Salvador was, was one of the most dangerous places ever in the world. Worst place in the world to live. Um, so he succeeded in cleaning up that country. How did he do it? So they kept trying and trying to stop these uh, these these gangs. Uh, they were the... Um, uh, MS-13 gangs, um, that's uh, Mara Salvatrucha uh, gangs, um, and they they were just d devastating neighborhoods that people in those neighborhoods couldn't walk out. They had to, there were people had to pay money to to operate a, uh, a store in those places. They were they were in danger constantly. Just one of the most terrifying countries to live in. People were getting murdered right and left. It was just horrifying. So they couldn't seem to do anything about it. So what happened was he declared a state of emergency. He just rounded up the living crap out of everybody who was involved in the gang or connected to a gang. And some people say he overstepped um, by basically not going through such a legal system, shall we say. But interestingly enough, the country is now the safest country in Central America and South America combined. One of the safest people are thrilled. That's why they reelect him. They're like, we can finally go out of our houses again. We finally aren't in terror all the time. We finally aren't being murdered in the streets and our children aren't being murdered in the streets and our children aren't being pulled into drug dealing. The, the, the citizenry, the good citizenry generally is thrilled. There are a few people who say, hey, you took one of my relatives and, or my son and he wasn't guilty. There are those people. And sometimes it could be true, but most of the people are absolutely thrilled that they no longer have to live in that hell hole. And so the question always comes down to in these situations, let's see if I'm gonna find the thing I wanted to, um, um, okay, where is it? Okay, it's over here. The question comes down to when you have to balance out the safety of, um, let's see if I can find this. Uh, okay, yes, this is this person's comment. The report, they had out of control gang violence. OK, gang violence is a type of warfare with its tragic civilian casualties. It is. It's a massive warfare and civilians get harmed. People, innocent people are getting carjacked and murdered. People are getting in New York. The motorcycle gangs are attacking people. People are dying and are afraid to come out of their homes. I don't even want I mostly don't go into Washington, D.C. anymore. And that's pretty sad because I used to love the place. I don't go in. So businesses are failing. They closed down CVSs because of because of the uh, shoplifting. So. The whole society becomes under attack by lawlessness. So then the question comes down to what do you do about it? And what's happened in recent years is that we've decimated the police forces. We're lowering the, letting people out of prison. We're lowering, we're lowering, doing, having no bail, no required bail for people so they can just walk right back out if they commit a crime. So we have this increasing problem in the United States. I don't know about the rest of the world, but in the United States, yes. But here's the comment that I thought was really great. El Salvadorians will have to balance gang threats with law enforcement injustices. So law enforcement can do things that are unjust. The criminal system, the justice system can do things that are unjust. 
there are there can be psychopaths on the police force who can overuse their power and harm people. Uh, there are people who can be arrested wrongly. Then all this stuff is true, and then you have to balance it against just allowing lawlessness to take over, where everybody becomes a victim, where where you no longer can even function in the society anymore. So it's it's a balance. It's a it's truly a balance. Um, but we're seeing uh, an increased lawlessness in the United States through the drugs, through the cartels, uh, through just lowering of uh, any kind of um, uh, penalties. And letting it just, it's, it's just gotten out of hand. We might become El Salvador. So just pointing out, I think it's really interesting how now the president there is like, everybody loves him now because he's cleaned up the country. And, you know, it's, it's now a place to go. I might go visit El Salvador. It might probably safer in El Salvador than it is in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Craziness. But that that's that becomes a, a an issue of of the justice system and the policing system and it is always you know people like to point out you know especially when you got you know, say you have a, a cop who does something that's not right you don't you don't want that you want to you want to weed out the bad apples and you want to hold them accountable but if you take down the entire police force you're going to be living without a, poli a police force good luck <laughs> you know good luck um Let's see, Kurt Broughton says, more and more drugs come in, came into German harbors and get undetected because the stuff is more corrupted than ever. Oh, interesting. So Germany's suffering from that. The whole the whole um, fentanyl thing is really fascinating because it's just, you know, it's just, you know, you have little teeny pills and everything. It's just amazing. You can really move that stuff. Um, yeah, it is. It's collateral damage. And we have to decide what kind of collateral damage we, we're willing to, to deal with. So, and by the way, um, oh, let me call a second. Let me go up here. Um, are we talking about the Super Bowl? <laughs> I don't know anything about that, but I did watch the Super Bowl. Yay, Kansas City. That's three seconds of the game were phenomenal because I really thought the 49ers had them. And, and uh, I was, we were the only, uh, my friend's husband, uh, well, my daughter's friend, and her husband invited me to come and join everybody. And most everybody got tired because they now have kids. So they all went home at nine o'clock. She fell asleep. And her husband and I were the only ones awake. And he was a 49ers fan and I was Kansas City. So he was pretty sure they had it. You know, it's, it's, there's no way Kansas City can make it last three seconds. <laughs> I, have to, I had to enjoy that. Um, one gang hijacked a TV station, put guns on the speakers heads a month ago. Oh my God. I mean, it is craziness. It's craziness. Compton. Well, you know, yeah, Compton used to be, it's funny because Compton used to be uh, straight out of Compton, you know, uh, Compton, uh, California was a rough, rough area. And um, that people always talk about that, but now it's like, it's spread across you know, the whole country. Um, South, Southeast Washington, DC uh, is an area that used to be considered dangerous, but I did a lot of work down in Southeast. I, I worked as a Inter interpreter in Southeast in the hospitals. And I also, um, I worked as a PI in Southeast. Um, I never had any problem. It didn't bother me a bit. Now I wouldn't go anywhere near it. But then I'm, I'm, I'm not happy with going to Baltimore either. And I'm not happy with going into even what used to be nicer areas of uh, uh, Washington, D.C. People being attacked all over the place. It's, 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 it's absolutely out of control. It's very frightening. And it's like, and it sucks because I loved, I you know the city was, had gotten so nice. I was like really enjoying it until everything went the other way. <laughs> well, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> the only two sane people are me and you, Pat, and I have doubts about you. <laughs> hmm. Okay. <laughs> Maybe you should. Maybe you should. Oh, oh goodness gracious. Um, <laughs> Let's see if I have anything left. That's we're almost out of time, but let me see if I have something left. Oh, um, I, I mentioned this case because you, I was asked about, I didn't talk about this last week, did I? Because I, I think I forgot to do it. And I'm, you know, I ran out of time. That's probably what happened. I ran out of time. But this is the, um, a Florida dentist was convicted of having his brother-in-law killed and his mother was charged in the plot days later. Um, if I didn't talk about that, there's not, a lot I want to say about it, except for this. All right, so this was the Markle. This is a uh, this name. This is um, uh, Dan Markle. He was in a, a custody dispute with his wife after they got divorced over the two kids. 
And she wanted to move away from where they lived back down to Florida, where her mother is. Um, and she wanted to take the kids with her. And he objected. And let me tell you, folks, this is a huge problem in divorce. Do you have the right to take your children and just go someplace else because you have a good job or because you want to be near your parents? Do you have the right to take the children away from the other parent uh, because you have, you know, for whatever reasons? Um, and, you know, it's hard enough with divorce for children getting to see their parents uh, either because they're doing the every other week thing or it's going to be the weekends they spend with this parent or whatever it is. But when you move the child across the United States, it becomes or whatever, it becomes a problem. Um, so I personally think, when the, you know, you're kind of stuck, in my opinion, if you have kids with somebody. If they're not a danger to your children and the children deserve to have their mother or father in life, I believe you should have to you have to suck it up and stay in the area until those kids are grown. That's my personal opinion. Well, in this case, she wanted to go to Florida and he didn't really want her to go. So uh, let me just read you the basics of the case. But the, what what amazes me about this case is is more of the. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, that's OK. Uh, let me find it. Uh, let me find it. Oh, come on. Where are you, Markle? Here he is. OK. So the basic story is that he um, he was Markle is an attorney and law professor. Um, and he was murdered in Tallahassee, Florida, in a murder for hire motivated by child custody issues following Markle's divorce from Wendy Adelson, a clinical law professor and child advocate who's also employed at Florida State University. Wendy, Wendy Adelson has not been charged, but she has been named together with her brother, Charlie, and her mother and their mother, Donna, as conspirators in the killing. Four individuals have been convicted in the case, Luis Rivera pleaded guilty to murder and was sentenced to 19 years. Sigfredo Garcia was found guilty of first degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder, and he got life in prison. After a mistrial was declared in her original trial, Catherine, Catherine, sorry, Catherine Mag Magbanua was found guilty of first degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and solicitation of murder. Charlie Adelson, when his, when his brother was convicted of first degree murder uh, and conspiracy to commit murder, and he got life in prison, and then Donna Adelson, the mother. So let me go back to this picture here. So mommy's, the son is on the left, the one who, the brother who's in prison now. Mommy was also uh, going to be um, uh, charged. She was arrested at Miami International Airport on a warrant, apparently trying to flee to Vietnam, which didn't have an extradition treaty. She's been charged with first degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and solicitation of murder. So now you wonder, first of all, basic two things. He was in Tallahassee and he was shot 11 a.m. in the morning. They 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 knew he was targeted. Um, and what happened was, uh, let's see. Um, essentially, the whole family wanted to get rid of Markle because they didn't like him. They didn't like his you know, anything about him. And that is, they had a religious issue between Judaism and Catholicism. He was Jewish. He was Catholic or whatever. And then... Um, they had issues over location and all that stuff. And God knows what else. But the thing about the case is if you're going to, if you're going to do somebody in, you do not want to involve at least seven people. You know, <laughs> they had apparently, let's see how this all went. Um, the motive was a desire of the family of Wendy Adelson to allow her to relocate to Miami with the children. They weren't even, Okay, it's not even Tallahassee, Miami. Okay, it's too, a bit of a distance. But, you know, in my opinion, she could have she could have handled being in a different city in Florida and just visited her parents. They seem to have a lot of money. So she could have whipped back and forth without a problem. Um, she, she wanted to relocate to Miami with the children. Catherine Magbanua, who had mothered Garcia's two children. I'm, I get a little confused here was alleged to have been the link between the Adelson family and Garcia and Rivera. So you get this whole, somebody had to look for somebody who could commit the crime. And it, it, it turns into this big, huge, messy thing. So I'm not going to go into all of that here. Um, that's one of those storytelling things some other channel will do. But what I want to point out is this. How many people did you have involved in the one shooting of this one man? I mean, hiring people, then you got this person who's you know, talk, speaking up, and uh, you got all these connections, you idiots. So... Just to let you know, in case your future want to get rid of somebody, the simplest method works. 
the simplest method. You know, you cannot, once you hire somebody, you have the chain of you had to get the phone calls, you got money to them, all these kind of things happen. Um, they can turn on you, they can rat you out. It's a lot of work. Um, generally speaking, people get away with crimes are the ones who do something so simple that it's just, it's just hard to prove anything. But this is like everybody was involved. I mean, they had, they had a crowd of people involved in this one murder, which is so fl flaming unnecessary on top of it. Just ridiculous. Just ridiculous. And now, of course, the kids grow up. They're not going to have a dad, not going to have a mom. They're not going to have a grandmother. They're going to be the most messed up kids ever unless they somehow can look past all of this absolute insanity. Just what kind of people are these? You just got to wonder about that. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's, just, it's very complicated. So also I said, I'm not going to get the whole thing, but when you're going to get off somebody, you don't want to involve half your family and, uh, a whole, and a bunch, a whole bunch of, a whole hit team. I mean, it's just, it's just, just ridiculous. And they apparently, nobody knew what the heck they were doing. They're all incompetent. And this is what people also don't seem to understand is you don't know how to do these things. You've never done it before. You don't know what you're doing. And so therefore you make mistakes and they made a tremendous amount of them. So all of them are in prison and mommy didn't even make it to Vietnam. <laughs> Grandmommy. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Um, <laughs> well, you might be right about that. In Donna's mind, Tallahassee is the armpit of Florida. Oh, the kids will suffer so tremendously. I mean, obviously they're being, their family has money. Both sides have money. Uh, they're going to go to good schools. Um, it's, you know, this is where you take petty, a lot of petty crap and just blow it up. Um, it just makes no, it, it's, it's more of a, there's some psychopathy in here. I have to believe you can't, I'm going to say wife, wifey probably was pretty psychopathic. She got that from mommy and her brother wasn't too great either. So I get a whole psychopathic family and I don't know anything about Markle. Um, uh, I don't know if he's a good guy or wasn't a good guy, but he sure picked the wrong woman. I can tell you that. But all of this over what? They were still, they were even in the same state, for God's sakes. They weren't that far away and they're both wealthy. So, you know, it wasn't like, you're, you know, you're leaving your, your two kids. Um, you want to get your two kids away from your drug using uh, homeless you know, husband. In this case, it, they could have worked it out over the years and just made it. It's just unbelievable. And these kids now have lost everybody. Maybe it's a good thing they lost their mother, their grandmother, and their uncle because they seem like scumbags. But just just crazy. They have a... Uh, Charlotte says, Dan was a good man and they allegedly did away with him for the custody of the kids. Yeah, but why did they, why did they so desperately need custody of the kids? I mean, everybody wants to have custody, but they could have worked out something very reasonable. Um, they have a mom. Oh, what? Um, I'm, I'm a little confused here. They have a mom. She is, she's going to prison. <laughs> um, <laughs> narcissistic mobster mama. Yes, that, that, that pretty much is true. That's a good, that's a good name for it. Unbelievable. Yes. It's, it's all about control. And it just amazes me that everybody thinks, even if, even if you don't want your other significant other to have as much involvement because you don't, I'm not talking about people who are, I mean, if your significant other is a criminal, a psychopath, abuser, drug user, all that kind of stuff. Oh, that's one thing. But if your significant other is just, you think he's a jerk or you just don't like whatever you don't like, uh, you know, um, a lot of us feel that way about our exes. <laughs> you like, but a lot of times they can be perfectly reasonable parents. You know, I've always thought that with my ex. I mean, you know, I have other issues with them, but I have to say, I think it was a good, it was a good dad to his kids. You know, he was, he was always a good dad. Did he do, if, if we, if we had separated early, I, I mean, I was married for 25 years and we didn't, we did not separate till after the kids were grown. If we had been together uh, and we, if we had separated earlier, I wouldn't have been happy about the back and forth crap and, you know, the new girlfriends coming in and all that stuff. But I have to say, I think he would have been reasonable in his care of the children and even his choice of females, because he's on wife number three now. They're not bad. 
wife number two, she, she, she well, my name was Pat too. So <laughs> she looked just like me, go figure. But they, they were married 10 years. I didn't particularly think she was the most fun person, but she was, she was decent. Um, and she was decent to my kids when they were older. And now he's got another one. She seems pleasant enough, you know, so no, nothing's perfect in life. Nothing is ever perfect, but, but um, hiring a hit person to kill off the father of your kids to just to get custody because you just want that kind of control. You're a psychopath. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh, she's she's not in jail yet. She, she's not in jail yet, but she should be in jail. I think she's coming up for. A, she's she's been charged, hasn't she? And the, and and you know, I think she's been charged. Let me see. Um, that's uh, twenty three, twenty three. Um, uh, let's see. Um, where is she? I'm trying to I'm trying to find out um his ex-wife changed the la boy's last name to okay I don't know about that um uh as I said I wasn't getting I wasn't getting deep into this case uh, because I was I'm not telling the story of this case the, the story's there is not there's nothing really to analyze other than don't have so many people involved in, in, a, in a hired hit. I mean, you just, the, the way they did it, it just amuses me because these are people who didn't know what they were doing. And they were obsessed with doing something illegal and wrong. And they're psychopaths, but they weren't very... Um, yeah, okay, the grandmother's charged. The father, father was convicted. But, oh, she had immunity? And she has had immunity interesting well that she should have no she should have no contact with those children oh they have a mom well even if she's in prison they have a mom they have a grandmother and, a, and an uncle too they're just going to be in prison um uh but i would think she if she's in seems like she's involved in this uh this hit so that she should never have access to her children period I don't know who's going to take care of the children. I say I'm not getting into all the details of the case. That's not my thing. But I just wanted to point out what what I struck me was interesting. Uh, she will be charged one day. I hope so. But um, okay, let's see. I've got just a couple minutes left. Is there anything left? Um, I missed. I want to talk about today. Um, let's see. Um, I think I covered almost everything here. Well, that's, I know somebody asked me about this. Okay, I'll, I'm going to talk about this just for a second. I don't know that I want to do a whole separate video on this uh, because it's one of those very political things. It's the shooting of Daniel Shaver. He's a young, uh, his young man um, he got shot by police in what was pretty much a horrific video. You can you can find the video on YouTube. It's pretty pretty horrible. Um, and, and since I have sometimes supported police shootings thinking they were reasonable, the question is, did I think this one was reasonable? So to end the show, I'll do that. On January 18th, 2016, Daniel Shaver of Granbury, Texas, was fatally shot by police officer Philip Brailsford in the hallway of a La Quinta Inn and Suites in Mesa, Arizona. Police were responding to a report that a rifle had been pointed out of the window of Shaver's hotel room. After the shooting, the rifle, previously assumed to be a lethal weapon, uh, which remained in the room, was determined to be a pellet gun. Following an investigation, Brailsford was charged with second-degree murder and a lesser manslaughter charge and later found not guilty by the jury, which people were really upset about because you could see the guy in the hallway trying to follow these instructions and ended up getting shot. Okay, so... I want to, I, I, only thing I want to say about this, because I want to just uh, clarify again, um, it, it, when you're in these, these active shooter situations, things are a lot tougher than people think. And even though it looks horrible and I'm, and there are some things, some things I think were wrong about it. And I'll tell you which ones they were. Uh, there's also reasons why he got shot, which is unfortunate. Um, he was 26 years old now. Uh, oh, sorry. That's the, that's the killer. Okay. What happened is this guy goes to the, Mesa La Quinta ends. He's um, he was staying there, was working, and he invited two acquaintances uh, to his room for drinks. There, he showed them a 
scoped air rifle he was using to exterminate birds inside grocery stores. He had a, this was kind of his job. At one point, the gun was pointed outside his fifth floor window, prompting a witness to notify the hotel receptionist. Following this, police were immediately called by the employer, employee, called by an employee at the hotel. All right. Just to say, once you point a gun out the window, there is a, an active shooter situation. They don't know what's in that room. Who the hell points a gun out a hotel window? I don't care if it's a fake gun. Once you do that, you set up a massively dangerous situation. The theory is the two were drink, the three were drinking too much. And then these were, bro, look what I can do. And then I don't, they said they don't know who, but I'm gonna say probably him that pointed it out to show how he would shoot birds. You don't point guns out of windows at a hotel unless you want an active shooter situation to come down on you and a SWAT team to show up. Now, the problem is they did show up. And at that point, when you look at this hall, this hallway picture, what you see is it appears to be just this poor lone guy. The girl, the girl that was with him, they, she was out there too. They told her to follow instructions and they let her go. They found out she had nothing on her. They, she walked by, not let her go, but they, they, she's out of the hallway. He is now there by himself trying to follow these instructions. What's, what's important to note is that they didn't know what was behind him, and people ignore that fact. They don't know if there are other people coming around that corner to shoot them. They can't, they can't clear anything because they don't know what's in the room. They don't know at this point that the gun that was pointed out the window wasn't a real weapon. They don't know if there's 10 weapons in there. They don't know if there's bombs in there. They don't know if there's five people in there. They don't know what's around that corner. So they got this guy. Now is there. He's, and he sounds stupid. He sounds stupid. And some people think he's drunk. And he, they asked him if he was drunk. And he said no. But he's not following directions real well. But now the guy who's pointing the gun at him is not giving the directions. So when you go look at this thing, understand he's not giving the directions. He's just focused on him. Another guy is giving directions. And that's the guy I think is kind of an ass. He gives very bad directions. And so he was shouting at the guy in a way that if you were trying to follow the directions, you might be so freaked out. You can't, you know, your brain isn't going to function. you got guns pointing at you. you got this guy shouting these things and being very, very aggressive and saying, keep your hands in the air, then do this and do that. It's almost like people say it was like Simon says. That's the guy that had the problem, not the guy with that with the gun. The guy, guy with the gun had to do what he had to do. He had to shoot him at the time he did. It was the guy giving directions, I think is really the one who caused the problem. Now, he had to give directions. This is true. But he gave them in a way that just, I find, not acceptable. You can you can listen to the video and hear that. Um, why did the guy eventually get shot? Well, at a certain point, the one thing he did, which is what got him shot, is at one point he went to put his hand behind his back, and they said, okay, put your hands up. Don't put your hands behind your back. They told him you can't put your hand behind your back. Because anytime we can't see your hands, we're assuming you're going for a weapon. Now, mind you, at this point in time, they don't know that the weapon pointing out the window wasn't a dangerous weapon. They're still assuming this is a possibly an active shooter situation. Maybe more people back there. The guy may have a weapon. You know, just because the guy's acting goofy doesn't mean he doesn't have a weapon on him. Or something. He could have anything. Have a grenade, for God's sakes. We don't know. So Guys pointed the, and he put his, they, 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 they didn't shoot him that time. They gave him a second chance. The problem was when they had, the guy shouted the things at him and he was coming forward on the floor. He was supposed to, they told him, the idiot told him to put his, to lock his hand, uh, feet together behind him and then to crawl forward, which was kind of an awkward thing to do. And there was a little confusing thing about the hands, which I think is a problem. I think the guy handled it badly. The guy given the instructions. But unfortunately for this, uh, what's his face again? Um, Dan Shaver. Um, he apparently when he was going forward, he again put his hand behind his back and that's when he got shot dead. Now, some people say he was just trying to pull up his pants because, you know, when you're crawling along the floor in an awkward position, sometimes, the, 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 you know, your, your shorts, your long, I think he had long shorts. I'm not sure what he's wearing. What was he wearing? I think it was, but anyway, they're catching and pulling them up, down his butt. So one of the natural reactions is to reach down and pull your clothes up. The problem is when you got guns trained on you, your hands don't go any place but stay exactly where people can see them. It's the same thing when uh, you're at you're at ten and two in the car, 
And per people say, well, they don't know why they shot the guy. And it's because he did this. And he was reaching for his license, but they, as, as soon as he did that, they thought he was reaching for a gun. You never take your hands off 10 and two. And if you're going to reach for anything, you say, do I have permission to reach to whatever? And then you do it in slow motion. <laughs> I use two fingers just so they don't see a, a grabbing motion. If I have to open up my, uh, say, glove compartment, I do it like this. And then I take two fingers slowly in there so that they think there's no way I can grab anything. But if you reach down, you get shot. If you open up your glove compartment and reach in like this, you might get shot. Ten and two, unless you've got exact permission, you always keep your hands 100% inside of a police officer with a weapon. Um, so unfortunately, twice. The second time when he went like that, regardless of what the excuse was, maybe he was drunk, but he reached behind and they shot him. I don't blame the guy who shot him. He did what he had to do. The guy giving instructions I have issues with because his instructions sucked and his his demeanor sucked. I mean, he you can be tough. You can be, you know, they're, they're in an actor shooter type situation. They think they don't know what's going on. You have to be tough, but you don't have to be so extreme in the way you're saying things and so confusing in the way you're saying things that the person is freaking out who's in front of you because their brain isn't functioning properly, especially if you're drunk. So I think the guy who gave the instructions was the one. I don't know if they ever, whatever happened to the guy giving the instructions. Um, uh, So for us, I can't, I'm trying to figure out who did what. Um, um, Langley was the guy that was doing all the ordering. Um, a guy named Langley, uh, uh, Sergeant Charles Langley. Um, Langley ordered Shaver, who was lying prone at Langley's request, to cross his legs. Moments later, he ordered him to push himself up to a kneeling position. While complying with the order to kneel, Shaver uncrossed his legs, and Langley shouted that Shaver needed to keep his legs crossed. Startled, Shaver then put his hands behind his back and was warned by Langley to keep his hands in the air, which is, that's reasonable. Um, Langley then yelled at Shaver that if he deviated from the police instructions again, they would shoot him. Sergeant Langley and, uh, told Shaver not to put his hands down for any reason. Shaver said, please don't shoot me which that doesn't mean much because people who are about to shoot you will say that too. Upon being instructed to crawl, Shaver put his hands down and crawled on all fours. While crawling toward the officers, Shaver moved his right hand toward his waistband. Brailsford, who later testified he believed that Shaver was reaching for a weapon, then opened fire with his AR-15 rifle, striking him five times, killing him instantly. He was Shaver was unarmed, but he was attempting to prevent his shorts from slipping down. Uh, the autopsy found that he was intoxicated which might have. So I have more issues with a guy named Langley because although he, he had to give those instructions, I wasn't happy with the way he gave them. And that at the end, he was a little confusing, but unfortunately you don't point guns out of windows and start this whole thing into action. And you can't ever reach for your waistband. You can't, you just can't do it. Now, if you're drunk, that's a problem. You're, you're stupid. But I guess he was drunk and stupid when he pointed the gun out the window, too, even if it was a fake gun. So, you know, these are very complicated situations. I, I'm not entirely thrilled with the, I say, that one guy. But on the other hand, I understand sort of why he got shot. So um, there you go. Uh, but that's that's one of those things. It was just such a, hor it was horrific to watch. It really is horrific to watch. Um, it's just, you know, you think, oh, my God. And once you know the guy is not, see, you're looking at it again. When I talk about hindsight. When people know stuff, then they go, oh, why did the play, why did they do this? Why did they do that? There was, you know, it was only a fake gun. They didn't know that. They didn't, just because the guy's claiming stuff and is acting like, oh, don't you, it doesn't mean he isn't somebody planning to kill you. You want to go home to your family at night. So when you have a situation like this, you have to understand, in hindsight, you know the guy's a, just an idiot. You know this guy did, got drunk, probably, got drunk, did some stupid thing, and ended up getting killed because he was couldn't follow instructions and put his hand down. You think, oh, poor guy. Then why did the police do this to him? But they didn't know that at the time. All they knew was that they had a situation where they didn't know if this guy was armed. They didn't know what was going on. And also, if they took their eyes off of him, somebody else could come around the corner with guns and shoot them all down. They didn't know who was around the corner. They didn't know how many people were involved in this thing at that point in time. So all these little things just 
Like, is he trying to distract us so that somebody else can get in position to take us all down? They don't know this stuff. So this is where, again, hindsight you, it makes it so much easier to know what, what why they shouldn't have done what they did. <laughs> but that's the problem is they don't have that when they're there. And so I have issues with the one guy. But, you know, sometimes horrible things happen because you do stupid stuff. And unfortunately, I think he did do stupid stuff. And I'd say I'm not entirely pleased with the instructions given. Um, uh, yeah, he does. He does have to live with that. Um, you know, the, it's that's one of the scariest things. You know, I have you know I have law enforcement in the family. My my uh, my daughter is law enforcement. Um, and um, luckily, she's a detective, so most of the time she's not on the streets anymore. But, you know, you just always fear for the day that she has to decide whether to draw her weapon or not and, and shoot. Because, you know, you, you, you know have, you, have you ever been in a situation where all of a sudden you're very frightened um, and you hear like buzzing in your ears and you're like, and you lose, you, everything goes into slow motion, all kinds of weird stuff happens. And people will say, well, if you're a police officer, if you can't handle being out there, you know, you, you know, you shouldn't have the job. You don't know <laughs> until that moment, because most, uh, most police are not involved in, in shootings. They are, they're not. Um, and so, and they're not involved with that moment. That moment comes so quickly that, you know, you can't, you can't see it coming. Um, and there's that split second decision thing, which th they do that uh, police thing, shoot, don't shoot. I've done that routine, by the way. And you sit there, and if you haven't ever heard of shoot, don't shoot, you're shown a video, and you have a gun. And some you stop somebody in the car, and then the question is, shoot, don't shoot. And so, like like one guy did some kind of thing, like reach toward the reach down here, and you shoot him, and it turns out, you know, that is all he was reaching for was his, his license. You see another woman, and she's just going like this, itching her hair. She pulled a weapon right out of her head. <laughs> So, you know, and you didn't shoot and that's, you're dead, you know. So unless you understand how, how that works, it's, it's, it's a little more complicated. That's why I always try to point out. It's not that I'm trying to dismiss uh, poor handling of things by police. I'm not trying to say a person who ends up being a victim has, you know, total blame. I'm just saying, try to understand it's always way more complicated. Most of the time, once in a while, you just get this <laughs> psycho cop and then he needs to go away. Um, but a lot of times it's very complicated and the situation is so stressful that it's, it's always sometimes very hard to determine exactly, you know, who's, who's totally at fault and how much you should charge them of being at fault and how much, you know, whether the person should lose their job or go to prison under certain situations. Um, it's very, very tricky. And I see in a lot of cases like this and say having somebody in law enforcement, you feel it a lot harder because you worry about, them being in a situation like that and ending up in prison for the next 20 years because in that split second, they made a decision that people disagree with. It's very, very, it's very tough. So, um, yeah, this is true. There are literal, there are literal seconds. There's no time for body language. You have, you're past negotiation seconds to make a choice. This is true. Now, again, I don't like that Langley guys that I think he botched the last just, um, instructions. I didn't like them. I didn't like the way he was shrieking because um, I, I think that escalated the situation. I don't think it was handled as well as it could be handled. I think that, you know, you got, you got the guy there and you say, you need, you must follow directions very carefully. So keep your hands above your head and then do not move. You have to, you have to speak strongly, but you also should speak very clearly and don't mess up. And I think the Langley guy was the one that screwed the whole thing up my opinion um as far as now again the dan guy you can't you can't read you can't keep your take your hands out of sight you can't do it but if you're drunk you're stupid and he, the whole thing was just a catastrophe <laughs> i come right down to it bloody catastrophe ah, so very sad anyway that's it it is 509 Eastern time. So I'm going to end this for today. Um, and um, happy Valentine's Day again to all of you who are celebrating. And for the rest of us, I'm going to make my dinner and watch TV. <laughs> I like to watch Chopped. I'm a, I'm a big Chopped fan. Uh, and Chopped and Beat Bobby Flay.
I learned, I've learned so much about cooking from that, that the bad part is I now can go into the refrigerator and have, there's just a few like, like useless leftover items. And I've learned to make them really tasty. <laughs> it's like, darn it. Now I can find food when I shouldn't be able to find food. And then I eat too much. So, but I do enjoy it very much. I, I, I like learning uh, little tricks of what do you do with this and this? And now I'm able to figure it out um, and how to put together some really odd ingredients. So I, I, I've become a better chef through those shows. So anyway, most welcome. And sorry about all the laughing. <laughs> It's a really, it really, it really set me off. Just like I say, like, a, you know, kids around the table and you just want to get started laughing. The, the visual was just so awful. It just made me laugh. That's terrible. I know I'm going to hell. <laughs> Wait a minute. Of course I'm a psycho. I might be, you know, nobody has ever, I haven't been, I haven't been evaluated yet. So um, I, I could be that. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> Thank you for the free bonus romance episode. <laughs> well, do watch that movie. I truly, truly recommend it. It's just, it's just the sweetest love story, and it's got the most beautiful music. Via Zara. I'm a big Bollywood fan, so but Via Zara, check it out if you just want a lovely thing to watch tonight and uh, bring some, some, some beauty into your life. Anyway. <laughs> I will see you guys uh, this weekend for whatever case I'm going to do, which I'm not sure yet. So you still have a chance to keep poking at me and telling me you haven't done this one, Pat. I've asked you like 10 times. Ask again. Oh, if anybody is new to the channel, I don't think I told people to like and subscribe and to join Patreon. Oh, well, there you go. I completely forgot. Join Patreon if you want to be in the chat room, like and subscribe <laughs> and keep the channel going and don't laugh. Terrible situations like me. <laughs> Bye.